Who you gonna call? Hello, my trigger happy friends. My name is Stevie Cade, and with the new Ghostbusters Afterlife trailer that, that dropped a few weeks ago, I thought, what better time than now to revisit the Ghostbusters series, the first two originals and the 2016 reboot. Ghostbusters was a very big part of my childhood. This, the original movie came out when I was one years old, so I've grown up with this franchise my whole life. It's embedded in my genes. And for Christmas, my son bought me the original two films on Blu-ray, and I thought, what better opportunity to dive back in? But before we do that, if you could please hit that subscribe button and the little bell ding thing so you get notified every time I upload a new video. Grab your keyboards, head down to the comments section, and let's review Ghostbusters. A movie brought to you in part by cigarettes and beer. <laughs> There's an awful lot of cigarette smoking and beer drinking in this movie. You can definitely tell it's an 80s film. So let's jump in immediately to what I like about this film. Right out of the gate, this movie tells you exactly what it's going to be. It sets up a situation with the librarian where she's kind of being hunted by a spirit and you get this eerie and spooky feeling that really sets up a darker tone and then immediately brings you right into the title of the movie which kind of lightens up the mood and pretty much tells you what this movie is going to be. A funny movie about ghosts. It doesn't take itself too dark or too light. And the way they illustrated the ghost being active was a phenomenal use of practical effects. Like all the cards flying out of the, uh, the thing, what's that called? What's that thing called? The index card file thing, drawer? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, prime example of practical effects right there. All that was was just regular cards in a drawer and somebody on the other side using a straw blowing air to make the cards go flying everywhere. Brilliant. Doesn't look fake because it's real. It's a real thing happening. Or when the eggs fly out of the egg carton and start seeing them cook on the tabletop. That today would probably just be CGI. Not in this movie. I'm pretty sure they just made a stove look like a countertop. And then there's the costume designs. Okay, well, the costume designs might be a little outdated, Maybe, maybe really outdated. <laughs> I don't know what it was about the 80s. For some reason, bad guys wearing leotards seem to be the thing. They all look like they're about to go ice skating. But <laughs> with that said, I mean, look at Gozer's eyes. That looks like it hurts. I imagine if this movie was made today exactly the same, but with CGI, it would look creepy, but not like this. This looks like it's painful. I want Gozer to go to the doctor. It makes my eyes itch to watch. That's what practical effects does. It makes us relate with what we're seeing in the movie. Prop designs. These things are timeless. Whoever designed these props did a fantastic job. You know, in a lot of these movies, especially in a horror or sci-fi sort of genre, the props in those movies are kind of in a time capsule. You can tell that they're made in the 80s or 70s or whatever generation they were made in. But the designs made for the props in this movie are pretty timeless. I mean, you could use those same exact props from that movie and put them in a movie today. They're not dated at all. So, although this film does have some major 80s influence just because it was made in the 80s, at least the props are gonna be timeless and can be carried on throughout the franchise. And they make for great toys. This is a family-friendly film. It's got borderline cartoony, ghoulish-like apparitions, but it's also got adult humor. Maybe some really intense adult humor. What you inside me? <laughs> Go ahead. No, I can't. Sounds like you got at least two people in there already. Might be a little crowded. But that's okay. Like, it doesn't separate. It doesn't have to be just a kid's film or just an adult film. That's the magic of these movies that came out in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and most of the 90s, is that they were a good balance of both. Today, I feel like movies are lacking that. It's either for one or for the other. The characters. There is a major camaraderie and chemistry between the entire cast. To me, that's what makes the jokes land. They seem organic, and not just a whole bunch of punchlines delivered over and over and over again, which is what I believe the reboot had a major issue with. But we'll get into that when I do my review for that. So let's dive deeper into the cast. Bill fucking Murray. I don't remember Peter Vakeman being such a dick. What's this one? It's a couple of wavy lines. Sorry, this isn't your lucky day. 
I, uh, ah, I'm getting a little tired of this. Growing up, I just thought he was being funny, but now I realize he's just a jerk. But it's not in a majorly unsettling way. We all know and tolerate somebody like this, and we love them for it. Every group of friends has that asshole friend. I might be the asshole friend of my group. Guys? I'm not sure if the character Peter Venkman was actually written or directed to be this way. I'm gonna guess it's just how Bill Murray is, cause he's kinda like this in most of the roles I've ever seen him in. Is this true? Yes, it's true. But he's also charming and witty. He's got that bad boy thing going on that every lady goes crazy for. Which is why Sigourney Weaver as Dana Barrett is perfect for him. They're a great counterpart in contrast to each other. She pushes back. She doesn't take his bullshit. She sees through his playboy act, and most importantly, she doesn't need him. She's not the damsel in distress. She is a successful, a strong, and an educated woman, which is right where Sigourney Weaver fits perfectly. She just empowers those type of roles. Dan Aykroyd as Ray Stance. He's the memes behind the Ghostbusters. He's the one that financially supports the Ghostbusters, but he also brings reasoning to the team. He's kind of the bridge that links everybody together. You know, if one person has a problem with another person, he's usually the one that comes in and solves that issue or brings them together, which is a very important person to have on any team. Harold Ramis as Egon Spingler. He is the scariest member of this team and also my favorite. He is the mind and the inventor that brings all the goodies. He always has the upper hand because he's mentally ahead of everybody all the time. Like Batman, like he's just like five steps ahead of everybody. He's Batman, he's Batman. He's a lone wolf with a borderline unhealthy disconnect from human beings. I can kind of relate to that. Ernie Hudson as Winston. He is the everyman. He is the relatable character that the audience can attach to. If there's a steady paycheck in it, I'll believe anything you say. Which is why he should have been in more of this film. At one point when Eddie Murphy was attached, he had a much bigger role. Through a whole bunch of script rewrites, it just, I don't know, somehow his character just kept getting pushed back, pushed back, pushed back. A little messed up for the movie, but I think they rectify it in the sequel. The background characters, they're just wacky enough to not be forgotten and actually keep interest in the film. Annie Potts has Janine Molnitz. She's quirky, spunky, and she kind of has to be to deal with four dudes on a day-to-day -day basis. Ghostbusters, what do you want? I like quirky. Then we have Rick Moranis as Louis Tully. This guy is a comedic genius. John Candy was originally cast in this role, but there were some creative differences between him and Reitman. I don't think it was a bad thing. I think Candy just politely stepped down. It was a very professional move on Candy's part, and he was right. Rick Moranis is so good in this movie. He steals every scene that he's in. He's exactly the type of slapstick this movie needed. It's not too much, but it's goofy enough just to make you love the guy. You root for him. You, you want him you want him to be successful, he does get the girl he wanted. Even though he was being possessed by a multi-dimensional terror dog at the time, you get what you can, I guess. <laughs> I mean, he does, he does, he does get the girl, in a sense, in a weird, freaky, paranormal way. Now to the plot. To bring these four New York locals together to fight against a dimensional being who's trying to end the world and it climaxes with a boss battle between them and a giant marshmallow. This is brilliant. This is brilliant movie writing. It really gave us something that we've never seen before. And that scene in itself has its mark in cinematic history. Even though the plot was solid, I do feel that the story was a bit rushed and like the main bad guy wasn't fully hashed out. Which is what leads us to what I'm on the fence about in this movie. Raise of hands of how many of you thought this was Zool growing up. Are you a god? I sure did. I thought that was Zool. From the get-go, we hear the name Zool. There is no Dana, there's only Zool. Zool, Zool, Zool. With very light mentions of Gozer. I thought Zool was the main bad guy jumping from form to form. But it's Gozer. Gozer's the main bad guy. As I said before, we got very little dialogue about Gozer, no illustrations, and no real build up to the character. So when Gozer shows up at the end, it's like, who are you? We are built up to know Zul the Gatekeeper and Vin's Clortho the Keymaster, which is a good story. Like having those elements, you know, that build up to Gozer is good, but they kind of left Gozer in the back burner. So when, he, when Gozer shows up, as a kid, I just thought that was Zul. We're, we're talking about Zul this whole time, so 
that whole storyline leading up to Gozer was rushed to me, but it's not really too noticeable because the chemistry between the cast and the overall humor in the film just kind of carried the movie through, but I feel that there definitely is a very rich story that could be told about Gozer. And if I remember correctly, in the trailer for Ghostbusters Afterlife, we do get to see what I think is a terror dog's foot. So maybe they will kind of bring back Gozer and dive deeper into that. And another storyline that was kind of mentioned in passing dialogue that I would have liked to have known more about was Dana's apartment building. Who, what, where, and why did this person build this apartment building? They hint that this building was designed specifically to do this. Who built this? That seems like a good storyline to actually kick off the movie with. But again, much like Gozer, it's just a quick dialogue and just move forward. So moving on to what I don't like about this film, and there's not very much, I'm not gonna lie. So these are definitely going to be some just more petty things I'm pointing out. Like the fact that we have three scientists that do not test equipment or talk about safety issues before using their nuclear equipment. There's something very important I forgot to tell you. What? Don't cross the streams. That just doesn't seem like a very scientist thing to do. Maybe if Peter Vinkman was in charge of that, I could kind of just understand him dropping the ball because that's just how he is. But I feel like Egon would be very thorough with this. And it's a little out of his character just to kind of, oh yeah, by the way, uh, don't cross the streams. It was there for more comedic purposes and didn't really make sense for the characters to actually look past those. They never catch the librarian ghost from the beginning of this movie. That's always bothered me. I think she should have been the first catch that they had. Even though I liked them catching Slimer and that was a great scene, you know, with them in the hotel, in which they still could have had just fine, you know, after their failed attempt. Get her! I think it would have been a good badge for them to wear, like, yeah, we got her right here in this thing. I mean, besides those, I don't really have any real negatives about this movie. Maybe the fact that the effects are pretty dated, but can't really blame the movie for that. If I read a script in 1984 and I was being told that we we're going to shoot down a building-sized marshmallow man that was sent to us by a multi-dimensional being who wants to destroy the earth, I would consider that pretty ambitious. This movie is always a fun choice to pop in the Blu-ray player. Not only is it funny with the right balance between family and adult humor, but it also has a good relatability with its audience. Each character has their strength and their weakness and they play very well into both. All four Ghostbusters collectively are the heart of this movie, but the storytelling didn't flow as good as it could have and the effects are pretty outdated. That makes its rewatchability for kids today not so great. For those reasons, I'm giving this movie a B+. That was wonderful! Bravo! I loved that! That was great! Well, it was pretty good. A little side note though, a little something that I noticed is this parallel with Die Hard this movie has. Hear me out. So we obviously know this guy, People think they're seeing ghosts. Plays this guy. I'll go and I'll steal a truck. Hey, give us a break, Thornburg. Eat it, Harvey. And Die Hard, which is essentially, he's playing the same asshole character. He's just copy and paste. And then we also have this guy. Yeah, that's a wild goose chase over here at Nakatomi Plaza. Everything here is okay. Who is also this guy. Okay, Ghostbusters. The mayor wants to see you guys. The whole island's going crazy. Let's go. So both guys are in both movies playing the same exact type of character. And then we have the exploding rooftop at the end. I'm not saying Die Hard cherry-picked things from this movie, but I think Die Hard cherry-picked things from this movie. Or maybe it's in the same universe. Yeah, but Asshole Dude has a different name. If I was single-handedly blamed for releasing hell on Earth, I'd probably change my name too. Everything was fine with our system until the power grid was shut off by Dickless here. They caused an explosion! Yep, that's it. That's what I'm going for. Die Hard and Ghostbusters are in the same universe. Let it be written, let it be done. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments below. Uh, be sure to check out some more of my videos right here. And as always, stay trigger happy, my friends. Peace. Stated representative of the city, county, and state of New York, I order you to cease any and all supernatural activity and return forthwith to your place of origin or to the nearest convenient parallel dimension. That ought to do it. Thanks very much, Ray.